Good afternoon to you all. I'm smiling um, ear to ear. I'm delighted to be here uh, with Martha Wainwright this afternoon at Galway International Arts Festival. Critics have called Martha's acclaimed memoir, Stories I Might Regret Telling You, unflinching and remarkable. The Irish Independent said, rarely has a title been so apt. Born into a family of famous mu musicians, in stories I might regret telling you, Martha Wainwright develops a perspective that is entirely her own. Full of wit and candor and fierce intimacy, it reads like having a glass of wine with a woman who has truly lived a life and you do not want that glass of wine to end. So we're lucky to have an hour with her this evening. <laughs> Where's the wine? Where is the wine? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's do it again. A big round of applause. Welcome her. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on the book. What a book. Thank you. And it is there I would like to begin. Your music is renowned for its emotional honesty, right? You know, putting that rawness out there, making something beautiful from the pain. In some respects, memoir writing seems to sit exactly alongside that kind of song craft. But I wonder, did it, Martha? You know, where did the book begin? Mm -hmm. What was that shift like from songwriter to book writer? Well, it was very difficult. And, but I also knew that it would resemble um, some part of my songwriting because I w um, had never written before in any other way. You know, I didn't keep diaries. I don't uh, have a um, tendency to write journals or, or, or anything like that. So I knew that I, um, there, w there would be a, a candor perhaps that would, that would exist and it would be probably autobiographical like my songs are, very telling of my story, but that's sort of, that's all I knew. And as I started to write, the reason that, that it came about is because I was asked to write a memoir, and many musicians now, and other types of artists and people are, are, are um, have been asked to write memoirs because there's been some success, you know, in the last 10 years especially, and in and, and the last 10 years or more, Musicians don't sell records anymore, <laughs> you know, and, and you sort of go, well, maybe this is a good thing for my, um, you know, for my, uh, I wanted more of the world to know my music, too, because as, an, as a musician, I don't have a lot of um, commercial success, you know, so I was like, well, this would be good for me to do. And then, of course, also, it appealed to my ego. I think uh, many artists, we think that we can do it all. You know, like, oh, you know, I'm songwriting. Maybe I'm good at painting, and I, I can do poetry as well. And, oh, of course, I can write. And the, 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 I, I had been asked to write the book by a publisher through an agent, uh, also because I had written a couple of pieces for um, a British newspaper for the Times, I believe, and uh, another... I don't know if it was for the Guardian, but at, at, at a and I and I guess there was something in there that they felt there was a voice or or something, and then I had to write a proposal, and I did, and I, and, and it was accepted. So there was some work involved. It wasn't just handed to me, but the proposal was you know whatever five pages long, and but I was happy to take the advance because I needed the money, and I had just had a, my second child, and I thought this is going to be great. I'm going to go about this, and I'm, I got myself a new computer, and, and I really pictured myself being able to do this. Mm. And a year went by. I cashed the check. A year went by. <laughs> and then I thought, I better get started, you know, because they have these deadline things that I've never heard of, you know. <laughs> and, and then I opened the computer and, and stared at the blank page and thought, what have I done? Mm. Um, because I could sort of write for a while, you know, a few paragraphs or a few pages, and then I was like kind of spent, you know what I mean? Because I didn't have any um, history of writing. You know, I had no discipline. You know, you hear about writers writing six hours a day and all this stuff, and, and I thought, holy shit, you know, what have I gotten myself into? And I tried things. Some of it would be good, you know, but then it would just sort of run out, you know, and I would try different stylistic things too, like, Maybe I'll start with, I'm in a bar and I'm talking to somebody and there's a dialogue. You know, I would do that. But I, because I was not a writer, 
and I'm not really a, a, a writer per se, I couldn't sustain that mm. for more than a page or two. You know, it would just fall flat. So I looked to the title, um, which was the already decided the title. It was based on, on the proposal that I wrote, and I guess I used the word regret a couple of times. I thought, okay, well, the title is Stories I Might Regret Telling You. I'll write some stories. People know me from my family. I'm going to write about my family because people want to know about it. I've met a lot of famous people, too. I'll write about them. You know, and then I was like, I'm just going to write what I know and about myself. And I started it, you know, from the day I was born. Mm -hmm. And then what ended up happening is that it was a confessional almost to myself or something. You know, it was, it was a, like a journal all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And then as I was writing, it was paralleling my own life, you know, and the marriage that I was in. And, you know, my parents, they were terrible parents, you know. Like, I sort of knew this, but then I really realized how <laughs> terrible they were and why I felt, like, so shitty about myself. Because I, I went back and I listened to songs and looked at pictures and thought, God, I, I wasn't that ugly. I wasn't that bad. And then I looked at my own behavior, too. You know, I was, I was a really, you know, party animal. I, I still am known to go out. To, I, I, there was no judgment, though. Uh, that was the other thing. You know, it wasn't going to be a book about a book about becoming sober or a book about, you know, I've changed, I found God or anything. It was just more like a... Um, revealing a nudity that felt good to um, expose, I suppose, and 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 what ended up what I ended up exposing, you know, was my 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 life as a uh, and my family, and through that a lot of taboos, whether it's abortion or drugs and alcohol, death, divorce. And then I think it became clear that my story and my family was like very many people's story and their family. The backdrop was different. The backdrop was music and you know rock festivals and famous people. But there were lots of things that have touched many people. Yeah. So that's how I did it, you know, mm -hmm. and I just and I wrote a lot down, and the voice that I could depend on was very much more like my speaking voice. There was some poetry in it because I would have some experience writing s songs, so sometimes it does feel kind of writerly in a nice way. So there wasn't that, but it just, and then I just kept on, and then I had, and then I write it, write, wrote everything down, and then I had to take a lot out because it was. Uh, incriminating to myself <laughs> and other people. And that was fine too. That was good too, because I didn't want to get sued or have my children be taken away from me. You know, so we just sort of, I whittled it, and then, this is a really long answer, but I'm almost done. This is fascinating. Um, and then, you know, after, and, and, I, and because I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, acting as a writer and I was doing other things in terms, of, I was like, bringing up the kids, and I put out a record and all this stuff, I would, I would write for, a, you know, a week or two or three, and then I would let it go. I wouldn't touch it for, for weeks, which is terrible, right? But then that gave me an opportunity to go back and read and go like, no, that, that's bad, you know what I mean, or that's not interesting. And then I just kept what seemed to me to be the thing that, that caused the most amount of feeling in me when I read it back, and that, you know, made some sense. And then uh, after about four years or so, four or five years, four years, they were like, you better hand it in. You know, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but it was kind of pretty wild. And the publisher said, uh, you know, we don't, uh, we don't like this, so you have to hire an editor or something. And they wanted me to give back the advance. And I was like, no. <laughs> and so I found somebody else to do to publish it. And I and I also I I I started began um, 
the process of a very bit difficult separation and divorce, and there was a trial and things like that. And my lawyer said, "You can't publish anything. You know, like you got to be careful because you have children and all this stuff." There's me taking drugs and all sorts of things in the book. So I didn't touch it for about a year, and then I thought, "Okay, I have to give back the money. I put in all this work. I've lost a lot of my." I've, I've, I'm destroyed by the divorce. It was very painful. And then I thought, you know what? I kind of want to finish it. I kind of want to publish it. And so I went in and I adjusted and I took things out that I thought could be damaging but, try, but kept in the things that I felt was really important and took a chance and thought it's more important for me to do it and to finish it. I'm so glad and you I did. did. Yeah. yeah. And no one sued me. <laughs> it's fine. It's not that bad, really. Mm. It isn't. No. And I, I it just... It's written with love, right. I think. I think and I, but I think that comes through, Martha. And I, I just hearing about the birth of the book, mm. it's, what a prolonged process it was. Yeah, it's long. Yeah, and it's... Yeah. <laughs> but, and yet, it feels like such a coherent, singular piece of work, you know? And I think that says so much about persistence. Yeah, it does, and taking out. <laughs> Right. You know, and then and then I didn't have an editor through the book, but at the end, you know, um, 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 a, a, a friend came in, and the Canadian publisher, and she was great, and it was really helpful to have somebody, and she would send me stuff, and I, and I was so done at that point, I was like, great, it's fine, whatever, do whatever you want, you know, I don't care, but but, uh, you know, she she just sort of helped to sort of, you know, do that thing, yeah, you know, yeah, which I was really grateful for because I was sort of at the end, I was sort of spent. But you battled that blank page and you won. I did. Yeah. You can't edit a blank page. You've got to get it down. Yeah. And you did it. Good. Thank you. Yeah, well, not easy. Not easy. No. Staying with that notion of regret, you said something to The Guardian earlier on this year that really stuck with me. You said, things I regret le led me to find out who I am. And I thought, well, that's a very different way of looking at regret than the way we tend to which is like, you know, this kind of dead end or this, you know, something that's been wasted or we haven't, you know, brought to fruition or whatever the case may be. Can you talk a little bit more about that idea? Um, well, I, you know, as you're saying that to me, I'm thinking about, you know, um, the regrets, the things that, that, that are bothering me today, you know. Uh, I sound like I've, I've found God. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and it's very hard to say that every, that I that I I don't want to think that everything that I've done or things that I've done have been a mistake um, you know but at the same time I'm battling with these things that are bothering me that and and how I that, how did I get here what are the things that I did that 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 created this um, problem I'll, I'll tell you what it is in a second but um, and then and through thinking about it, I I always come to the conclusion that it was not a mistake. That it's never a mistake. Mm. That there's no way. That it's just me being tough on myself, mm. and me trying to think that I can control it or should be able to control it. I'm not someone who's good at controlling the situation. So I am accepting that I am very. Um, um, I have lots of faults, you know, and I'm not in complete control of things. And, you know, it, it, I, for, for me now, the, the, the main difficult thing is, you know, um, my kids, not seeing my kids. I still have difficulty with their dad, and sometimes it gets so bad, and you think, what are, what are, why is it like this? What, what was it the bad decisions that I made that brought this? But then you think, well, you wouldn't want it any other way, of course, mm. you know because then it would be different, you know? So I, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it just seems to me that these things that are regrettable seem to have really formed who I am mm. and have brought a lot of joy and a lot of happiness as well, you know? And a lot of life, because I, you know, I'm, I have done things that are not careful, mm. and that has led to, um, you know, disasters, but it has also led me here to you and mm -hmm. and to a very charmed life, actually. Mm. I mean, that was, you know, in, in reading your memoir, that's one thing that struck me over and over again, 
you may have been down, but you were never out. You were yeah. never, ever out. If you just, you, you found a way through. And I think that is a thread throughout the memoir. Yeah, and it touches, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. you've, I mean, in the last 10 years in particular, just about, I mean, you've been, you've had a huge upheaval in your life, good and bad. And yet, as you say, here you are. Yeah. With a book. <laughs> right, exactly. And I, and, I, and I don't know where that's going. You know, I, sometimes when I get really bleak, I'll, I'll like make jokes. I'm like, ah, oh, the, am I waiting for my cancer or something? These kind of <laughs> concepts of what is the next big thing that's going to come and really destroy you. You know, really destroy you. You know, and and in the book, it it it, it keeps it it starts. You know, it starts the first page. I describe not being almost not being born because my mother was was on on, a, on, a, on an abortion table when she was pregnant with me and then freaked out at the last minute and that caused you know that allowed me to live and whatever. And so just this idea that it's so close all the time. And then as I get older you know, and I'm getting shit-faced and taking hard drugs and I'm sort of almost in the gutter. There's something in me that says, I don't want this, or gets up and becomes, allows me not to become an addict. What's different, but what's different from me than the, uh, the addicts that we see on the street who did not, weren't able to get up off mm -hmm. the, 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 the pavement, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So I don't know what it is, and then later, you know, going through this really difficult divorce and being separated from my kids and really going for walks that would lead me often down to the river, you know, and it's, and I would look at this river in this way of like, I, I didn't, I'm not suicidal, but you, sometimes you get to a point where you're like, I don't think I'm suicidal, but my God, there's something in me that wants to jump mm. because something would stop. You know what I mean? But then you, but then something wins out and goes, no, 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 of course not. But that doesn't mean we can't look at the river mm. and think that, yeah. you know, and then, and then walk up the road, mm. you know. Yeah. I don't know. It, it helps to, be, to get down and then come back up. It's helpful yeah. to know you can. I think a lot of people wouldn't have that bravery, Martha. And I think that's what it is, like to look life in the face and see it for what it is. And not to run away, but to respond to it. Sometimes in good ways, sometimes in, in less constructive ways, yeah. but never to back away from it, never to be cowed by it. Right. You know. Yeah, no, I made a lot of, I, I do, would do stupid things that would bring me to places that could be dangerous. But for some reason I got, I, I turned away from them. Um, and I think in writing the book, maybe I discovered some of the reasons why I made some some of those stupid mistakes. And 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 as I was writing the book and going through uh, the divorce and at the uh, near the end of the writing process, and really the hardest part, of course, was decide. I was writing about about uh, my divorce and 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 Brad, the the father of my children, and also. A the man that, that I was madly in love with and worked with and he produced records and we had the, uh, we were very connected. Then this, this artist, m myself, who had always said anything that I wanted to say, say about people, bloody motherfucking asshole, my dad this, my dad this, fuck him, fuck that, whatever. <laughs> when you have kids, you can't do that. Mm. It would destroy them. Yeah. And, you know, and I would, I would be so upset by something that, Brad had done it, write it down, fucking, you know, whatever, left shit on my front door, I mean, like, whatever, and then you'd go, I have to take it out, and then you go back and read it a couple of months later and go, thank God I took it out, because, like, who wants to know about that, and how terrible would that be for the children to read that about their father, you know, like, yeah. whatever, you know, all this stuff, and um, then I realized, okay, the thing that I have to do is to not... Um, do what my parents did. Mm. You I was just, as you're saying that, I'm yeah. like, but you know, that self awareness that you have, that compassion that you have for your children, that is hard won. Well, it's hard won because that's not what they, did. my parents right. did. And, and I guess that that's, I think, I don't want to blame my parents, but I have to in this situation of what, what was it about me that, that made, that felt so shitty about myself, you know? And when my dad told me that he, he you know, tried to force my mother to have an abortion, and he told me when I was 14, that hurt my feelings. It didn't matter, the abortion part didn't matter. You know, we all are faced with those decisions. You just shouldn't tell young people that stuff. Yeah. You know, and when, when 
your parents are talking shit about the other parent. You shouldn't tell people that. You shouldn't mm -hmm. tell your kids that. And mm -hmm. that, I think, was the main lesson that I, that I learned. And it's not easy. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> but, but you have to harbor it. You have to, be, you have to hold on to the, the resentment and, 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 and not put it on your kids. Yeah. At least until they're older. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that again speaks to something, inter some internal resilience that you have, that you, you could learn that lesson and bring it forward. You know, because uh, uh, if you were consumed by bitterness and hadn't seen that lesson, I don't think anybody would blame you. Right. But to have felt those feelings and, and had those experiences and taken something really positive from, from them and been like, well, I'm, I'm breaking that link or I'm, I'm going right. to do things differently. Well, I, I, I think also what happened to me is that when I was 33, uh, I, I was pregnant with my first child. My mother was very much near the end of her life, dying of um, cancer, that she was diagnosed at 60 and, and um, dead three years later. Um, and right at that time, I gave birth to a very premature child. And before that, in my 20s and 30s and my teens, I was a wild kid. I was pissed off with my mother. I was, and just the fact of losing your mother when you're young and becoming a mother of a sick child, you grow up really quickly. Mm. You're, you change, mm. you know, and in a way, it was the silver lining for me. There was a silver lining, sorry, in it was that uh, it made it, it forced me to um, get smarter, to uh, grow up in a way, to take care of my child, to take care of myself, and it adjusted my way of thinking because I was no longer the kid. There was no my mother was gone. My father. He's still alive and great, and I adore him, but he was never much of a parent. So, you know, I don't, didn't have anybody to take care of me. I had my brother, Rufus, and I, my brother Rufus, be, and I became really close. Mm. But all of a sudden, I had to step up in this way, and it did change me. Yeah, I, 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 just at that point in the book where you have these, I mean, two huge life events effectively colliding, the loss of your mother, the premature birth of your first child. If you had fallen apart, nobody could blame you. And yet, Martha, you, you went into this kind of like a, like an like a, like an, an organization mode. You sorted out homes. You sorted yeah. out transport. You sorted out healthcare. You flew back and forth across the you know between Canada and the UK, doing whatever needed to be done. And it is, I mean, I I read it and I was I just I was in awe. And you were also the breadwinner, I think, for yeah. much of this as well. Um, and we talk about strong women a lot, and they can often be a kind of a shallow interpretation, kind of an archetype, but this, this is the real deal, right? Well, this, yeah. You just stepped up. I remember I had the baby in London. It wasn't meant to be, um, uh, Archangel, my first son, was meant, to be, was meant to be born in Montreal. I was gonna return to Montreal and be with my mother at the end of her life, and hopefully she would have the opportunity to hold him in her arms, and maybe that would allow her to live longer. This was my, Dream, and and I had um, I had just I put out a a PF record, and I had a couple more dates left to do. I was six and a half months pregnant. I had one more show to do in London, and I was going to fly back and have my last trimester with my mom. And um, I went into labor on stage. I finished the show, <laughs> and then I said, "You got to take me to the hospital." And I thought the doctor was going to send me home. You know. Mm -hmm feet up, bed rest, mm -hmm. and then uh, my waters broke, and they were like, we got to, and I was in shock, um, and um, where was I going with this? I, what I guess what I was, what I was going to say is that these, um, and then I lost my train of thought, my goodness, I got, I, the, the, and that happened simultaneously with, you know, the, the, with my mom being really ill, and she, Interestingly enough, it wasn't that interesting, but, but she ended up being able to meet Archangelo because he was born early. And she flew over and, and uh, got to, to hold him briefly in her arms. There's a photograph of them together. But um, that, that story you know, formed, that's the main part of the book, you know, is that, that, that story. 
Um, and that really formed me, you know, very much and, and changed my whole trajectory um, of how I saw myself, you mm. know. And, and that's, that's what I was thinking of. You were talking about breadwinning. So when, when the, the insurance person came in, he said, what are you doing here in London? And I said, I'm working. He goes, okay, that should be fine. We, the NHS will be able to cover this because I was in the hospital for two, two plus months. And I was like, okay, that's good, you know, because that would have been a disaster financially. And then, I, but then I realized I was going to have to get an apartment in London, and um, and so I, I called my agent <laughs> and I said, I'm going to need a show in about a month when I can, you know, like once I'm able to kind of perform again, and and uh, did it in London to be able to pay the rent, you know. So I booked a couple of shows and I was able to leave the baby in the incubator um, at night and went and I did my shows and sort of pounded about a couple of drinks <laughs> <laughs> throughout the milk, you know, because I was also like a, 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 you know, a really literally a cow because the baby was so little you'd have to pump all the time. There was just so much milk you, mm. you couldn't even. But anyway, so it was a great feeling to be able to do that too. And it really marked sort of that beginning feeling of like, I'm a mother, that's anything that I've ever wanted. Ever since I was, you know, 16 years old, I had this dream of being a mom, you know, in, in some way. But then also I get to get up on stage and play the guitar and sing songs and swear and drink beer and and be free, you know, and 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 my, you know, being both of those things, what is any, anything, everything I ever wanted. Yeah, what a work-life balance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just, just as you're saying there, you know, Martha, you, there are a lot of men and women who run from responsibility for one reason or another. A lot of creative people run from responsibility, the responsibility to themselves and their art, but you know, to, to wider your family and community, they don't really do. But responsibi responsibility seems to have uplifted you. It seems to have given you a new kind of purpose, even as a performer, it seems to have reached into every aspect of yourself. I didn't want to disappoint my mother. Right. You know, I remember when I got married a couple of years before she died, she was already sick. I, don't, I sh probably shouldn't have gotten married, but at the same time, I wanted some stability because I had always been so all over the place, and I think it made my mother nervous, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. I'm talking as if I was like, crazy I was I wasn't so much crazy as I was would do good shows and then sometimes I would like drink too much and lose my voice or smoke a lot or sort of fumble you know when there was when there was a, like somebody really important in the audience like a big record label or whatever I would do like a really bad show and then when there was like no one in the audience it was like fabulous you know like just <laughs> things like that and I think my mother saw that and, 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 it, and it bothered her, it worried her, mm. you know, mm. and, and Rufus, of course, was more successful and more together and more driven and male and whatever else, and I was sort of the fuck up, you know, and I think that made my mother nervous because she knew that I was talented and, and able and she wanted me to, to live up to that, you know, yeah. and, and, and so when she got sick, um, I just, I really wanted to set her mind at ease in some way. Um, I don't know if I did, you know, but I, I feel like I kind of, I just didn't want to let her down. Mm. And, maybe, and maybe now I'll realize as I, as I get older that I just didn't want to let myself down, and it's not only about my mother, but it felt like that at the time. I didn't want to let her down. Yeah, that's entirely understandable. Mm. Yeah. Um, Rufus. Yes. Yes. Uh, recently turned 50, I believe. His name is Rufus. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes, hatred. No, just kidding. And love. Um, he just had a birthday in Dublin. Oh, was it he last had, night or the it was, before? It was the 22nd. Okay. So whatever date it is today. It yeah. Was that. It was two, three days ago. And he played at the National, um, the National Concert Hall. Wow. I sent flowers. <laughs> and, um, and, um, um, but we spent the, we had seen each other a week before in, in Montauk, where he has a house. And Rufus uh, is the person who I'm the closest to in the whole world. 
Is that easy? Whether we like it or not. <laughs> We absolutely adore each other, but also what's kind of cool about us as siblings is that we're super close, and we became even closer mm -hmm. when our mother died because we just we had a, we needed each other, and started working a lot together, like doing tribute concerts and and also Christmas concerts and all this stuff. But but we also have the luxury of not having to see each other all the time because mm -hmm. he we're always on the road, and he especially. And he lives in Los Angeles, and I live in Montreal. So it's like a, a special, you know, every time. And oftentimes it's on a giant stage. <laughs> and then often, and oftentimes it's it's also in competition, you know, of like who can sing the loudest and who can sing the longest. So it's the same as as when we were children. Nothing's changed. <laughs> and I remember when Rufus when Rufus was younger, he would be like, you know, I'm the older brother. I'm the older brother. I'm I'm you know I'm I'm three years older than you are. Like you're two years older than I am. That's how it works, you know. Like whatever. And then when he hit like 45, he's like, "Well, you know, we're kind of really the same age." Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, "No, you're the older brother." <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I remember seeing you both perform. I think I think Rufus was he was in London. He was in Covent Garden. I think he was doing Judy. Yeah. And and you duetted with him at one stage. You came out. And I just remember him introducing you, and I mean, he was effusive, you know. Yeah. And it, um, it, what an incredible thing to share with your sibling. And yet, reading the memoir, you're also still siblings in the truest sense of the word, yeah. in that sense of competition between you, totally. both comes in. And I wonder, as artists now, having had, you know, successful, respective careers, you had, you, you know, starting out as Rufus, as a backup singer to where you are now. And I just wonder how things have changed in, in terms of his attitude towards you and vice versa. Well, time has, has, has mm -hmm. changed. And we've also made our own stories, you know, like both of us had to hear about the stories of our parents, you know, like I feel like I've been in the music business for like 100 years because <laughs> I myself have been doing it for 25 or 30 years, but then my parents have been doing it for 50 years and it's like, D -d 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 have I been here the whole time? Mm. Um, so, you know, I was in the shadow of my parents and then, of course, very much in the shadow of, of Rufus, who was like really impressive. And, you know, that was hard in many ways. But then, you know, I would just be playing shows and making music and in a different way. You know, he was more on a on a bigger scale with, with record a bigger record company and there was really a, a, a push and, and he has an incredible drive mm -hmm. in music. He's, this is what he was meant to do, you know, ever since he was little. I don't think he does dishes and makes sandwiches. You know, th there's not much, that, you know, he he's gets up and he plays the piano in a kimono, you know. <laughs> Ridiculous, <laughs> and uh, you know I don't I don't pick up the guitar for for weeks on end until I get uh, incredibly nervous and then I realize oh my god I have to write a song and then I do and I feel better. But I was just playing and playing and playing and then you know playing for opening act uh, oh, as an opening act or or doing releasing small um, EPs like you know and then eventually got a record deal and, and then people you know people like my music and and there was a certain amount of success but it was just going on in a different in a very different way mm -hmm. you know and then and so there was still a kind of you know why can't I be as big as him or how do I usurp my brother this is the goal of my life is like could I make a record that that makes me more famous than him so I I'm not as annoyed when I see him and um, <laughs> but then you know 10, 15, then 20 years passed, and you go, well, I've, I've done all this, you know, and this is just what it looks like. It's mm. just a different career, but, mm. it's a, but it's a type of career, you know, in the tapestry of the music business and the arts. You know, there's so many different ways of doing it, and I, I think that, that this, is, this is where I, you know, this is how I did it, and I, I get to be here, and, and, uh, and I get to, you know, um, I'm, I'm extremely lucky, mm. you know. Mm. Um, I, ha I have to write books to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm always thinking about what's going to happen next, you know, because mm. I am, I'm the breadwinner in my family, and I worry about that, and my kids, and who, what about if they want to go to an expensive college, and I'm 47, and will this, how do, how do I keep the train going? Mm. But I'm trying. You know, and I'm just playing and singing and 
doing the best the best I can. Mm -hmm. I was saying this to you when we met earlier on, when I, when I was reading the memoir, I was, I was thinking maybe I would give it to you. And I thought of myself as a young woman interested in creative fields, activities, and how for s such a long time, you know, stories like yours, Martha, were just not very available. You know, you picked up a magazine, a, a rock magazine, and it was full of men, you know, profiles of women were few and far yeah. between, books even less so again. Now we are going through a period of revision, which, which is really, really welcome. But I wanted to ask you about, you know, your experience, first of all, as an artist, as a young woman, and now an artist as, as a grown woman, but in an industry that some people would say is, is almost not fit for purpose anymore, it's getting incredibly hard, as you're describing, for any artist to hold on. And then for women, there's also the gendered dimension on top of that as well. It's a shit show, the whole thing. I mean, you know, I, obviously the music business is very, like many, like many businesses, very male business, you know, I mean, there's women in the music industry, but they're primarily singers, you know, and then, and and that's great, but you know, you don't see a lot of female guitar players or engineers or drummers, or you see them, but it's just, uh, whatever, not that many. There are more, which is great. Um, but then, then you know, you see these young women who are doing things and you kind of don't want to put all your shit on them. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, hey, I want you to like bear my cross, you know, my feminist crotch, cross. <laughs> <laughs> I you like know, both. You know, like, and I am a total feminist, you know, just by, by virtue of what I do and how I've always sort of driven myself through life to, 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 to get up on stage and play the guitar and, and be just as good as the guys and, you know, be the breadwinner, just my actions. Were like, But then, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to, like, call anybody out, but, but, like, then, you know, there's artists. I think for young artists now, it's harder to do that because that seems like something, some antiquated concept on us. Mm -hmm. So you have artists like, you know, Lana Del Rey, who I adore, who's like an anti-feminist. You know what I mean? And, and it's like, well, and I, but I really like her music. And I'm like, well, you know, it's hard. She wants to look that beautiful. And she has to be an anti-feminist. You know, you're like, and I don't really blame her. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I, I, this is her time, you mm -hmm. know? But, but you do feel pushed out of the time. I mean, I'm, luckily, I'm not a pop artist. You know, I, I'm, I'm a folk artist, so there's always going to be someone older playing. <laughs> so I'm fine. I'm golden, you know. And um, and that that is that. I mean, I joke, but that does really, you know, folk music and traditional music and music. You know, it's it's a long history. Mm. You know what I mean? And so. I'm just a part of it, you know, and I do feel like I'm, you know, young still in it in mm. many ways, you know. Mm -hmm. we're in, we're in the, what, isn't John McCormick from here, you know? Mm -hmm. He was my favorite singer when I was growing up. So, like, you know, I don't know, you know, like, it's okay to get, I guess for me, it's okay to, and in my, my the, the, the music that I make, being 47 is not that old, you know, and, but um, to answer your question for, you know, what, the fear that I have, I, I, I do, you know, get, I, I get scared of what, how it's going to continue and, you know, because I don't have any other skills. I can't teach at university. I don't have a degree. And, and um, um, so, you know, I wonder about it, but that's why, you know, that's why you're supposed to buy real estate when you're younger, <laughs> you know, and like hope that isn't a place that's not going to be, you know, um, near rising sea levels. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a real, that would be a real bummer. That's sort of how I yeah, think. Yeah. There goes the environment. On a mountain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? What? Well, just as you're, you're talking about, I mean, one thing that you did have that, you know, in, you don't have in other forms of music where you're more of a product is you have your, 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 your skills. You have your music playing. You have your songwriting ability. Mm -hmm. Nobody can take those things away from you. You know, that, that's True. a level of ownership and control that a lot of artists whose name we all know actually don't have over their careers. They're relying on battalions of songwriters to create their work, leaving them in a really vulnerable place. And you know, I wonder if that that's also why I, although I'm not, you know, although I, I, I still, um, you know, like to drink wine and, 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 you know, eat meat and all the rest of it, but I still, I wonder if maybe I do, I'm, I'm treating myself better physically because I do need this body. Mm to continue to um, uh, make music. The physicality of it is, is required 
you know, and so yes, you don't, you have to, you have to be careful. And, and also there's not very many models of women in the music industry my age either. I mean, and I don't want to just throw away that because of course there's thousands of, of women who have done this work and, 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 but you know, when I was starting out that, you know, either, you know, either you're incredibly talented and you, uh, but, but you drink so you fall down the stairs and die or you, you know, commit suicide or, and, and if you have children, then your career's over because you decided to become a mom or if you have children and you crept your career, you're a terrible mother and they have to take your children away from you. It was just like, Jesus Christ, it's very dramatic. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is, there's not a lot of options. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And that, that's what, you know, I, I was saying to you backstage as well, that's why I, I found particularly the, you know, writing with the last 10 years of your life where you, you have become a, a breadwinner and you were making it work. You're, you're here in Europe this summer, you're touring around, you're gonna return to Canada in a couple of days. You know, you're, you're gonna have some downtime then at mm -hmm. home, working on your craft, being with your sons. You are the model that you were seeking. You know, you've, you've done that, you've, you've gotten there. Uh, yeah, I became it. Yeah. You became it, right? I mean, well oh, done. Thanks. And I hope you know that having two boys that they recognize. No, I don't want that. I don't hope that they recognize that. That it doesn't come out right. I just hope that they, you know, have are are good to women because they're you know that's all. Yeah, that's what I would like. I just want them to be nice to women. I want them to be nice people. Yeah, but particularly to women. <laughs> Do you think they'll go into the family industry? I hope not. No, yeah, no, they're already, <laughs> the, 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 what, the eldest, Arcangelo, is uh, absolutely adores the stage, but he also likes baseball, so I don't know, you know, and um, the youngest, Francis, he he says that he hates music and hates folk music, but I, I hear him singing in his room, <laughs> and I don't dare disturb him. We're going to take some questions from, from the audience very shortly, but I have to ask stories I might regret telling you. Mm -hmm. Do you regret, Rianne, do you regret anything? No, I don't. <laughs> and that's why, you know, I mean, I, as I was saying earlier on, I was, I, I, I took a lot out, but no, I, I, um, I don't regret at all uh, telling these stories because I think they are things that need to be spoken about too. You know, and um, and I feel very, I you know, I'm I'm proud of it, and um, um, I'm I'm yeah, I'm glad that I'm glad that I finished it, and I'm glad that it, that it was published. Yeah, so are we. Good. So are we. <laughs> Big round of applause for Martha, everyone. <laughs> Does, uh, I, somebody has a mic, do they? Or are we just going to call questions from the floor? Or there's a mic, wonderful. If you would like to ask a question, please put up your hand. Yes, we've got a gentleman here. Hi, Hi go ahead. You don't need a mic. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, other events and like you were having your children and starting yeah. family and that was obviously maturing you in a certain way as well because you were thinking differently yeah I'm just wondering if you had been asked you may well have been asked to write a book and say you weren't married and having children and you were in that other phase of your life yeah. and you were asked to write a book I would would you have stuck with all those stories that you took out yeah <laughs> certainly certainly yeah 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 no yeah it would have been a different you know when I first started writing the book it was lighter, certainly. It was lighter and it was more like, oh, you know, like you, you like the stories of Glastonbury. Yeah. It was just, you know, getting shit-faced and having a great time and, and um, meeting rock stars and, you know, trying to get laid. And it was really fun, you know, to write that way too. But then, it, you know, it didn't, um, it no longer really was a reflection of my, my, my existence. It was the past, and I and I and I brought it up to, to today, or you know, two years ago when it was published. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, no, and I, and um, yeah, it certainly would have been a bit a, a, a different memoir. Yeah, mm -hmm. if that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. Any other hands up there? Yes, this lady here is that. Thank you. 
you facilitate other artists. Can you talk about the creative space that you run in Montreal? Uh, yeah. So I, I moved back to Montreal about nine years ago. I lived in New York for many years. But I inherited the, the house uh, that I live in when my mother died. And so I thought I'd better go back there and um, deal with all the shit that's in it. And also I wanted my kids to have a Canadian citizenship along with US citizenship. And then I got there and uh, was really happy. And the kids were in daycare and school. And then got, got a divorce. And I realized I can't really leave because it's complicated. And I thought, what am I going to do in Montreal? I love Montreal. I love cross-country skiing and taking walks. But I'm like, this is, uh, this is, this is a, uh, a smaller town than I'm used to. Uh, but it's good for the kids, too. And so I thought, well, what? And I need to be home more for the kids, too. I can't go and be on the road all the time. So I thought this was the opportunity for me to do, uh, sort of have this, make this dream that I've always had come true, which is like me. Um, in the kitchen cooking, because I like to cook at a restaurant and then singing. Like I had this idea of opening up a kind of a bar, cafe, community center weirdness. And I was like, well, this is the moment to do that. And this is the right city to do it in. And then I, so I, I opened up a cafe. And there's other artists who have done this. And I think usually they hire like managers and people who actually have experience <laughs> as like people or like they get like government funding or something. But basically, I mop a lot of toilets. And I, I, I do do a lot of the cooking. And the accounting is pretty funny. And, um, but, and, it's been, and it's been a labor of love with me and my new partner. I have a, an, an incredible partner. Um, and um, but the amazing thing that's come out of it, because it's a small music venue, is that I have op I've been able to see and create a space for young artists to come play in, and and in, in French and in English. And I'm just totally like, you know, it's not like going to folk festivals and being the, one of the younger people on the bill. It's like the opposite. It's like, you know, these new artists, all different kinds of music. And so it's really been great. And um, if you would like it, you can have it. <laughs> but you know that that's really um, been incredible, and I know that I'm not an entrepreneur, but I think I already always knew that, and um, it just in terms of you know being motivated by you know what it is to run a business and trying to you know keep costs down and all that, and um, but it's been really incredible to to see young people. And also, it's really connected me. This is a long answer. But another thing that's really connected me to is young people and how they think, which has been really helpful to me. I've always had a sort of understanding of marginalized people because you know my brother is gay and was gay from a young age. And so I've always had a really kind of strong sense of what that's like and was really sensitive to any like homophobic or stupid types of behavior. But now, just also really kind of understanding or being around people who are you know gender fluid and non-binary I think that's been really helpful to me to sort of really get a, a better understanding and so I'm really glad for that otherwise you just end up with a bunch of people your own age all the time and you don't really see what's happening mm -hmm. anyone else yep you yeah <laughs> perhaps because I'm old but you talked about women in the music industry yeah. and for a lot of my life, the background to it was the McGarrigal sisters yeah. and whatever about uh, parenting, I wondered about having, you know, two sisters who had such a huge musical influence in your life and who were in the music. I mean, rock stars and the word I want to use, but, you know, they were yeah. such important people. And also the other thing I thought it would have been wonderful if you'd read, I mean, perhaps not, perhaps you're doing it tonight, it would have been wonderful if you read a little from your, from your book. Thank well, you very much. I think, we, I think we've got time to read a little bit now. Just think of, I, yeah. I would like, I, I, as you said that and you want to read something, I just, I first of all want to tell you, because I've been talking a lot about, you know, my generation and then younger people, you know, um, Rufus and I were always influenced by the older generation. My grandmother, my grandfather on my mother's side was born in 1899. And my grandmother was born in 1904. So Kate and Anna's parents 
Kate's mother was 42 when she had her in 1946. So that was always assumed that she lived with her grandparents. And that music that came out of that house and the musical influences were from her parents' generation and before that. And Rufus and I have always had that. And tomorrow, I'm playing in Skibbereen. And then afterwards, I'm flying to Toronto to play with my Aunt Anna and their other sister, Jane, who's 82 years old and playing a pedal, a lap steel guitar and doing all McGarrigal material. So I just want to tell you that Kate and Anna are, you know, my, um, are the pinnacle for me. And maybe why it was hard to start, too, because I was so incredible musically and, uh, the, you know, giants. And uh, I, I, you know, am, 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 am happy to live out their legacy, really. Um, so in, in that respect, I will just read, well, OK, to that. And, and, and this, I mentioned this a little bit at the beginning. And this is on page one, and it does get a little nicer. <laughs> And my dad read the book, and he liked it at first. And then the second <laughs> read, he didn't like it as much, but we're fine. I was born Martha Gabrielle Wainwright in New York State in 1976. My mother, Kate McGarrigal, and my father, Loudon Wainwright III, loved me, or at, least, or at least they grew to love me. Loudon told me when I was a teenager that he didn't want me at first and pressured my mother to have an abortion. My mom freaked out just as the procedure was about to start, though, and the doctor spoke up. He was concerned for her, and he pointed out that Loudon and Kate were married, had some degree of financial stability, and had one child already, my brother Rufus. Maybe not the best reasons to bring a child into the world, but I'm glad the doctor opened his mouth. I was surprised when Loudon told me this story, and it also hurt my feelings. I had always felt a little out of place in the world, and knowing that I'd only just barely made the cut didn't help matters any. Perhaps he should never have told me. I don't think my mom would have. When I asked her about it, she said that he had given her an ultimatum, something like the baby and me or else the baby and the career, but not all three. I never understood why exactly, but perhaps dad felt threatened by her remarkable talent and didn't like the attention she was getting from record labels at the time. Mm. Yeah. I think we've got time for one more question before we bring things to a close. Is there anybody else? Is there a hand up? Yes, perfect. <laughs> that was the first page. I'll read from the epilogue. Mm. <laughs> Nothing really bad has happened yet. That sentence haunts me. When I started working on this book, it ran through my mind over and over. Was it wishful thinking? Why did I keep coming back to it? After Aunt Teddy read an early draft, I told her about the sentence, and she thought it was strange, too. Hadn't plenty of bad enough things happened to me? I replied, exactly. I will write that nothing bad has happened yet, and then I will describe some bad things, and that would be kind of funny, right? She wasn't convinced. <laughs> Neither was I, really, but the idea kept running through my mind. I finally figured out why when I was reading a novel by Miriam Taves, All My Puny Sorrows, while trying to stay away from Anderson Cooper and the other pundits on CNN. And I came across the sentence. The words, nothing bad has happened yet. A lyric from a Loudon Wainwright song knocked around in my head. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> I sat up in bed and racked my brain, saying the line out loud. And then it came to me in loud and sweet, high, perfect, melodic voice. Nothing bad has happened yet, followed by him sing speaking in a lower register, and everyone is happy. It's from a song of his called Thanksgiving on a record called Therapy, and refers to a photograph, or a time really, when everything was OK in my father's family, my family. In the song, he describes going down for his afternoon nap, something he still takes daily, like a two-year-old, <laughs> and having a dream about his family. Mother and father, both still young, and naturally they love us. We're all lying on a lawn at night, watching the stars above us. Lord, every year we gather here to eat around this table. Give us the strength to stomach as much, as fast as we are able. <laughs> Thank you. Copy.
copies of uh, Martha's memoir are available in the fabulous Charlie Burns. So if you like that, why not treat yourself if you haven't already? Um, she's playing tonight in Monroe's. It's going to be very, very special. We're absolutely thrilled to have her here. It's, it's just been great. Thank you so much, Martha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we get up and I think so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. you've been a great audience thank you so much for your questions enjoy the rest of the evening thank you to our wonderful host oh. thank you